Hello, my fellow scientists. Today I want to talk about nicotine. Nicotine is a small organic molecule found in tobacco products, and it's rather addictive. Recently, the United States passed some laws stating that people can't sell tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, to anyone under the age of 21. It used to be 18. And by and large, I think that's a good thing. Fewer young people hooked on nicotine products is better. Nicotine products kill a lot of people prematurely. Okay, that being said, I think it's maybe worth looking at some of the nicotine replacement therapies, and I I want to put it out there that I think that those should stay age 18 and over, and I'll back that up with this argument. Right, let's start with the description. A paper came out in an Indian medical journal summarizing all the results to date that they could find of the harmful effects of nicotine, the chemical, not just in tobacco smoke, but the chemical itself. And they found that there are some, right? So if you apply nicotine, the chemical, pure to cells, those cells undergo changes, and those changes look like they may cause cancer. Uh, that They conclude that that means that there's a risk of cancer associated with just pure nicotine. And I, I think their logic is sound up to that point. They then conclude that nicotine replacement therapies like patches, gums, and lozenges should be restricted to doctor supervision. And I, I just disagree when they go to that conclusion. I think that they're comparing the wrong thing. They're saying, let's compare the risk of a clean living with no substances versus that same scenario with nicotine. And nicotine has risk, therefore doctors should manage it. But that's not really the comparison we should be worried about. We shouldn't be worried about clean living versus clean living with nicotine. We should be worried about smoking versus nicotine replacement therapies. And there the question isn't, a small risk versus the defined zero risk. The difference is huge risk from cigarette smoke versus very small risk from pure nicotine at small replacement doses. So, I, you know, I just, I absolutely j get off the train when it comes to making that level of policy decision for something where the risk is so small it can't be measured. And I can back up that claim with the second article I cited in the description, which is a meta-analysis of all of the data that we have to date on nicotine as a pure chemical applied to actual humans and whether that has any statistical risk of premature death cancer or other diseases. And the answer is not enough to measure. Now, it's not zero, right? Um, so again, they, they cite their facts. They interpret it to say that the risk is not zero, but unmeasurable. And they conclude that the uh, that means that we should sell it over the counter to people who want it and over 18. And I agree with that conclusion. I think that the facts lead directly to that, that if you can't measure the risk, then, or if the risk is sufficiently small, then we should let people make their own decisions and not involve lots of hurdles that are going to reduce the utilization of something that could be saving lives. Okay. I have a third point, though, and that starts with the simple fact that nicotine use among the mentally ill is amazingly higher. So fourth citation in the description talks about this. It's three, three to four times the rate in the general population among people with severe mental illness are using some form of nicotine. And I find that fascinating. That suggests to me, my interpretation, that people are self-medicating regulating their internal chemistry with this substance, nicotine, that has a profound effect on all the reward centers of the human brain. That if you have brain chemistry that's trying to kill you, having the ability to take a drug that gives you a boost of rewards may be a really important way of regulating these problems. Uh, and, and it's something you don't need someone's permission to do for the most part. Until recently, if you're under 21. And so there, here's another issue where the risk isn't exactly clear, right? We're not talking about the risk of nothing versus the risk of nicotine. We're talking about the risk of associated with untreated severe mental illness versus that with nicotine. And if that helps, you know, that, that needs to be measured. And maybe, maybe, if the risks associated with nicotine lozenges are small enough, maybe those should be part of the arsenal for dealing with severe mental illness. Uh, in fact, uh, the fourth paper I cite in the description talks about a 
study where low nicotine cigarettes were provided to people with mental illness, and as a consequence, those folks smoked less. <laughs> but based on total nicotine exposure, they were cheating. <laughs> they were going out and finding other sources of nicotine because it was evidently so important to their well-being. So ultimately, I think that whether it's nicotine or any other risk behavior, we need to compare carefully the actual alternatives that are in the real world, not our imagined perfectly safe null case. Anyhow, with that, uh, I'll leave you, and we will see you again next week.